Um, we're here to today to hear about some research conducted by uh, three of our faculty members. Um, and it's on adverse childhood experience and bullying. And um, it's uh, called the ACES Project. It's a community-based project. It's very intriguing. And I think you, if you don't know much about it, I think you'll learn quite a bit today and be very um, interested and happy you turned out here. Um, the three uh, faculty members who are participating are Joanne Joseph. She's a professor of psychology. And her research interests include trauma, resilience, and physical and mental health. Uh, we also have Ronnie Titchener, who's here. She's an assistant professor of sociology. And her expertise is in the dynamics of power and violence in the family and is intimately involved with the ACES project. And then we have Rosemary Mullock, who's a professor of computer science. And she's um, a, it says here formally, but I, I don't think you can be formally. You either are or you aren't. It's like being a Marine. You're either, you're either, you're either you are or you aren't. And uh, she's a, um, has experience in the, um, as a social psychologist and um, now in the computer science department and is uh, critically involved in this project in the uh, acquisition and, and interpretation of the results of the data. So it's a, going to be a, a great presentation. I understand that Joanne's going to lead off and uh, she'll handle the rest of the uh, uh, handoffs. So, Joanne. Okay. <coughs> you can all hear me. I got a big enough mouth without a question. <laughs> So let me tell you just a little bit about where this project is coming from. This is what um, we would call a community-based research project. The interest and the question comes from a real problem in our community. And the, the question that they asked us to help them research and to figure out is how can we address the bullying issue in, in the schools? Uh, primarily, are there ways that we can actually identify kids at risk? And um, if so, are there variables that are associated with reducing that, that risk? Um, the, this is a cooperative effort, therefore, between our institution and the whole Oneida County Youth Council. And that Youth Council consists of the Health Department the school districts, districts, um, and all of the mental health agencies as well as the pediatricians. So it is a wide net that we are cooperating with. The other point that um, I would like to make is that I am privileged to work with these two individuals because this little old person would never be able to pull this off if I didn't have colleagues here at, at, at SUNY IT to um, as, assist. Uh, the question came because of, of, of involvement in the community on these, all these boards and all these service-based projects that we've been doing for years. Um, and as a result, we've been able to forge together a research project that will probably take us a couple of years, but the most important thing from my point of view is that it has impact. This is research that has real impact on real people, <laughs> and that's why it's, it's, it's community-based. And we're excited to share this because I think this is something that SUNY IT faculty might be interested in doing, because we're not a big university center, um, but we can get a hold of data um, like this. We can uh, follow through on service and convert it into um, research and scholarship. And I guess that's what this project has sort of taught me. And as I said, I'm, I'm grateful primarily to my two colleagues um, sitting here because this little old colleague would not herself be able to pull this off. And that's the uh, honest to God truth here. So without any further ado, Ronnie's going to start out by um, talking to us about the background um, information. Rosemary's going to follow up discussing the methodology and the results, and then you get to listen to me again. And I'm going to tell you about what the clinical implications are and um, the other opportunities that we are now being afforded as a result of this particular project. And to invite any or all of you who are interested in becoming involved, because as far as we're concerned, the more the merrier. We have um, engaged students here in this project as well. One of our students um, 
is on one of our research uh, papers. So it represents a really, really good opportunity all the way around, not just for us, but for, for our students as well. And Joe, before, you, before yes. you go, we're taping this, right, so that we can put it on the website? So. Do you think you, you can hear well enough? Are we picking up the voices? Okay. Carry on. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay, is it just me or do you hear a hum? Oh, yes. Yes. I'm wondering if this is yes. on. It's the speaker, right? No, okay. I thought maybe if I changed the mic. Where? Oh, okay. That's all right. I, it might be. I thought maybe it was the microphone here with a little bit of We'll try to overcome it. Okay, first, just a quick apology. I'm coming down with a respiratory bug, so my, I have two goals. One is not to breathe on anybody, and the other is to uh, not to cough my head off, but I've got a little water and cough drops, and hopefully we'll be good to go. So uh, just to start off with uh, bullying, the definition we use for bullying, what that constitutes, um, unwanted aggression from someone else or attention of, of some sort from someone else. Um, usually it's repeated, so it happens over a period of time. And it's definitely related to an imbalance of power. It could be an imbalance of physical strength between the, the two uh, individuals involved. Uh, could have to do with their social power, their ability to uh, provide access to resources or to include or exclude someone from the group, um, those kinds of things. Prevalence of bullying, it is a widespread problem, and there has been quite a bit of research done on bullying. So we know that both in Europe and North America, it is a problem that educators and parents in particular are very concerned about. Um, it has also um, been, the, the response to bullying thus far has really been focused on zero tolerance policy, so ensuring that schools have been saying, uh, you know, we're not going to tolerate anything that resembles bullying, assuming that they know about it, right? That's been kind of the approach, and the uh, emphasis taken in trying to address the bullying problem really has been school-centered, trying to figure out what we can do in the schools to change the dynamics, to make students more aware of bullying and its impact, and to um, uh, try to provide a safer environment within the schools for the children. That's important because our results are going to suggest that perhaps a different approach is, is warranted. So consequences for bullying behavior, we all know it's bad, right? Many of us, in fact, if I asked for a show of hands, there's probably a good number of us that would say we were involved in bullying um, as, as kids uh, growing up. We were the targets of bullying. And it does produce a range of, of consequences, all of which are negative. And so there's an increased risk of both internalizing and externalizing disorders. And of course, internalizing would refer to things like um, uh, depression, poor self-esteem, eating disorders, uh, cutting behavior, those kinds of things. Um, externalizing disorders would be anger and aggression uh, towards other people, juvenile delinquency, all of those uh, kinds of problems. And then there is a link, of course, to uh, physical symptoms, headaches, uh, gastrointestinal problems, those kinds of things, and poor school performance. None of that is a surprise, right? That's, that's not something that uh, is really uh, shocks us to learn. So. From the literature, we conclude that this really is a serious problem. And it's not just that kids are having difficulty fitting in at schools, but because of all of the uh, psychosocial impact that it has on them, it's something that we really are very concerned about and want to do something about. Uh, nationwide, it's about 30% of kids uh, who are involved in this. That's, that's significant, right? That's a lot. So we definitely want to um, come up with effective ways to address it. So we really need to understand better what are the factors associated with bullying behavior, both those who are engaged in it and those who tend to be victimized by it. And so what we've done is, is try to pull together a couple of different literatures to frame this in a, in, a, in a different way or to go beyond some of the framings that have been done already with trying to understand bullying behavior. And so we're looking at the average childhood experiences literature and the resiliency literature, and we are lucky to have um, an expert in resiliency here, Joanne, on our team. Um, her book, The Resilient Child, is still used by uh, educators and clinicians, um, not just locally, but nationally. So average childhood experiences. I feel like, because I talk about this in so many contexts, everybody should know what this is, but I know that not everybody does. Um, we call it ACEs for short. Um, this really comes from work that was done in the 90s out in California uh, with Dr. Zan Infinity and Kaiser Permanente, which is their big um, health insurance group out west. And um, there's a long story about how this all started, but essentially what they did was they started both um, a retrospective and prospective study more than 20 years ago now, 
where they looked at people's health outcomes and they tried to link them to these adverse childhood experiences. And the methodology is stunning in its simplicity because they simply asked nine yes or no questions of people when they came into um, the clinical setting. They asked before the age of 18, did you experience sexual abuse, physical abuse, emotional abuse, uh, physical or emotional neglect, uh, parental absence due to death or divorce, incarceration of a parent, mental illness in a parent or substance abuse problem in a parent, and then domestic violence um, in the home between your parents. Simple yes or no questions. From those questions, every yes became one point, and you get an ACE score. And what they discovered is that even one, an ACE score of one, increases your risk of a whole range of negative health outcomes. Not just the things we might suspect, like mental health problems, substance abuse problems, um, smoking, those kinds of things, but cancer, diabetes, high blood pressure, heart disease, a whole pregnancy complications, a whole range of health outcomes are associated with these adverse childhood experiences. And so this has become a pretty significant uh, body of research. There have been a number of studies that have been done now to kind of replicate this. Um, we have an initiative here in Oneida County that we call Stop ACEs Oneida County, where we're taking this information, trying to move beyond, okay, we understand there's this strong link between these dynamics and the home in particular, which is where it kind of plugs into my interest and expertise, and a whole range of um, behavioral and um, uh, health outcomes. Uh, the other, just a couple other interesting things to note about this study before we move on. One is that not only did one ACE raise your likelihood of, of these negative health outcomes, but if you had one, you were likely to have more than one. So these things hang together, right? Substance abuse is, is strongly correlated to all other kinds of abuse and so on. Um, the other key thing that you should know from their findings is that they found um, an effect with four. Once you hit four ACEs, you had a dramatic increase in your chances of having these other negative health outcomes. So there's kind of a, a dosing effect, we call it, as you go along. By the way, if anybody has questions as we go along or wants to hear more about anything, I think we, I can speak for all of us. Feel free to interrupt and, and just jump in. <coughs> okay, so um, there has been some work out there that has taken probably not the ACEs necessarily, but has taken some of the ACE factors. Uh, what, I, what I mean is to say by that is that people haven't necessarily adopted the ACE framework in its totality, but they've looked at some of the things that we call ACE factors and looked at their link to bullying. So there is some work out there. And so, uh, for example, we know that children who are sexually, emotionally, and physically abused are much more likely to be bullied. Not something that is, is terribly surprising. Um, we also know that people, uh, kids who witness domestic violence are, between their parents are much more likely to, um, to bully. And there was one study that was done recently that found, again, a dose-like effect for the ACEs. And so they saw that the more um, ACE factors that children had in their background, the more likely they were both to bully and to be victims of bullying. So there is some work out there that's in this same sort of vein. Okay, the other piece of our body of literature we're pulling from is the resiliency literature. And resilience is, the, is defined as not in, uh, being able to avoid adversity, but how well do you bounce back from adversity? What kind of skills do you have that allow you to push through difficult situations and um, sort of be okay from a psychosocial standpoint on, on the other end? Uh, bullying is considered an adverse uh, condition, and Joanne will talk a little bit more about how we're going to um, extend this research to talk about bullying as an ACE factor in and of itself. Uh, but our question was, we wanted to look at the impact of these adverse childhood experiences on bullying behavior, both perpetration and victimization, and to talk about, or, or to, to try to find out whether there were factors that would kind of protect you. If you, were, if you had experienced these, these, these uh, kind of risk factors, if you will, what might serve as a protective factor to keep you from being engaged um, in bullying behavior in some way. So um, some of the findings that we have out there from the resiliency literature that we're building upon is we do know that having a supportive family tends to protect uh, kids from the negative effects of bullying that we would see otherwise. Um, there's another uh, study that, could, that looked at both family and school, and again, this idea of being having family support or feeling connected to, say, a, a favorite teacher or something in school is, again, something that would um, help protect one from the negative effects associated with, with bullying. 
So what we're trying to do here is really increase the understanding of the relationship between bullying and ACEs and to take, um, to take the ACE factors in greater totality as opposed to just one or two of them. Now, Rosemary is going to talk more about our scales and so on. Um, the data that we have did not allow us to examine all of the ACE factors, but the majority of them were part of our, our uh, measures, and so we're able to do more than what's been done in the literature so far. And then we wanted to look at uh, family support, school support, and community support, which has not really been examined well in the literature. And really when we talk about community support, we're talking not just about support but engagement, to what extent are young people really connected to the community through things like volunteer experiences and so on. So those were the three sort of areas we were looking at as potential protective factors in uh, disrupting this relationship between ACEs and bullying behavior. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Rosemary to talk about the methods. <coughs> okay, um, if you just notice, uh, we uh, received this information from the, um, the 2011 assessment project and uh, the students that were involved in this, are, actually we had a fairly large sample, we had 2,244 who were students in middle and high school within Oneida County. And the purpose of this uh, um, assessment project is to uh, kind of catalog youth opinions and behaviors and identify problems that should be addressed by schools and communities. Of the students, the age ranges range between 18, uh, 11 and 18 uh, years, and they were in grades uh, 7, 8, and, uh, 7, 9, and 11. Uh, half of the participants were below the age of 15. Grades were equally represented. There were about 30% in each of the grade categories. And in addition, we looked at gender and found that it was almost a 50-50 split. It was 49.5 for males and 50.5 for females. The collection of the data um, was made up of a questionnaire that had 135 questions in it, a question booklet, and it was administered in the spring of 2011, and all of the surveys were administered on the same day at the same time, and they did in fact use uh, trained proctors, and in fact, one of, as Joe mentioned, one of our students was involved in that particular project. And what the proctors did was to come into the the uh, uh, testing areas, <coughs> excuse me, they gave um, a protocol about what was the purpose of the study, told the students to be honest, stressed the importance of anonymity and told them not to put their names on anything. And um, then once these were collected and uh, dealt with, the data from the survey was provided for, to us for some secondary analyses. Um, <coughs> As uh, Ronnie mentioned, we uh, took some of the questions and we developed some scales. And the, the scales that we developed were uh, ones that would uh, measure uh, community support, family support, and school support. And what we tried to do or, uh, was to look at <laughs> items on the, uh, the test booklet that were similar to things that had been used in items in the development of scales in the research. <coughs> and we also came up with one uh, scale for the measure of ACEs and then two uh, additional scales, one that assessed being bullied and one that assessed bullying others. Um, and the way that we developed these, if you looked at the data, there um, many of the items had several categories. But if you looked at the categories themselves, there really wasn't any clear uh, intensity differences among the various categories or ordering of the categories. So what we ended up doing was to simply, uh, if uh, they scored zero on it, it was considered none, and if they had a, a, 
a score on any of the other categories. We simply said it was one. So we had a presence or absence of each of these uh, elements within the scales. And then we simply added them up to come up with an overall scale. The, when you have a whole variety of um, variables that you are trying to determine their influence on a particular dependent variable, multiple regression is a very common technique that's used. But one of the problems with, uh, with it is that it has as its underlying assumption that the data that you're using, using can be ordered or in fact are interval scaled. Uh, uh, measures, but we're dealing with uh, nominally scaled measures, so we used uh, an analysis, uh, predictive uh, analytic technique, and at that time it was SPSS's answer tree, and now it's called decision tree and is part of the uh, SPSS package. And what it does is it uh, employs some of the uh, modern or current uh, analytic methods uh, in science and business. And in fact, there are four models. And uh, <clears throat> the first is the chi-square automatic interaction detector. The second is the exhaustive chi-square automatic in, uh, inter in interaction detector. And the difference is that the exhaustive one takes, as, as uh, uh, the tree is, is developed, it takes a variable and it develops categories uh, of each of the sort of levels or doses, if you will, that is a best predictor. The CRNT is a classification of regression, and what it attempts to do is to minimize errors in measurement. And finally, Quest, which is a quick, unbiased, efficient statistical tree. And in carrying out this research, the most typical mo uh, practice is to apply all four of the models and then see what you come up with as the best set of predictors. So we performed two sets of analyses, one with being bullied and one with bullying others as the dependent variables. And then <coughs> as the predictors are independent variables, we used the ACE scale, the community support scale, school support, family support uh, scales that were developed. And then we added some demographic data, uh, including age, gender, and grade in school. And those served as the independent variables uh, for, the, uh, it, for the analyses. And um, just want to take a quick look at our findings here. In this, what, what is that? Can you see that? <coughs> the first uh, model that we applied was the Chade model. And what it does initially is it develops uh, an original node. And if you look at the node, you see that 69.97% of the individuals um, indicated that they had not been bullied. And uh, therefore, if this was the only piece of information we had, what we would have had, predict, had to predict is that people, students, um, are not being bullied. But notice, we would have been incorrect 30% of the time. So we then begin building the tree. And at the next level, um, the analysis picks the, the next best predictor uh, and found that the scores on the ACES scale uh, entered as the next best predictor. Now at this level, actually five nodes were uh, generated on the tree. Um, but as uh, Ronnie was mentioning, the uh, <clears throat> higher the value of ACES or the presence of ACES, the more likely things were to occur in, in uh, the literature. And in fact, the, the three uh, nodes that were generated uh, were lower than three, and the modal category 
was that nobody uh, was zero, that they, they had not been bullied. So the figure here only shows the ones where there was a, a, an outcome. And if you look at the impact of ACEs, you see that when a score was above five, that now 79% of the individuals indicate that they have, in fact, been bullied. While in the three to five range, the modal category is still 52%. Uh, percent. But notice as we expanded the tree, the next element that entered was gender. And as we see, for males, the modal category was still that they are not being bullied. But for females, now 54.8% of them indicate that they have been bullied. So the factors that seem to be important then are ACEs scores above five, but with a combination of ACEs between uh, three and five, and the fact that you are a female increases the likelihood that you have been bullied. Okay, the, um, the um, analysis also provides us with a misclassification table or matrix. And if you'll notice, we have the predicted categories of uh, not being bullied or being bullied, and the actual categories of uh, uh, where they actually were not bullied or were bullied. And if you, uh, it calculates the overall risk statistic of having an error. And if you notice, when we started out on that first node, if I can find it quickly, we said that we would be, if this was the only information we had, we would be wrong 30% 30, uh, 30 of the time. But now, if we look at the risk factor, what it suggests is that the error in, in classification now is 26%, so that we've reduced our uh, error or we've increased accuracy by 4%. Now you may say 4% doesn't sound like a whole lot, but remember that initially we only knew that the prediction that we would have to make is that um, students are not being bullied. And after uh, 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 applying the uh, Chade model, we now know that there are certain factors that mediate or mitigate the bullying behavior, such as a high score on the ACEs and the fact that if you have a score between three and five and are female, those characteristics uh, influence that. The other thing that you can see here is that these are the uh, frequencies of individuals within each of these categories. So, these would be individuals who were predicted not to be, not being bullied, and who actually were bullied, and there were 1,117 of them. And the uh, individuals in this group would be ones that had been predicted to have uh, been bullied, and actually were bullied. So these are the hits, those are the correct categorization, and these are the misses. And if we look at our category for uh, uh, people who, in fact, were bullied, we find that of those folks that were bullied, we correctly categorized uh, a little over 30% of them. And in the group that was uh, predicted as not being bullied, and who actually were, of all the ones who were bullied, um, we have uh, correctly identified 89.3% uh, of those. So the next set of uh, results that we did, we're looking at bullying others. And we did find, actually on the, on the first one, we found kind of an interesting result where we saw that we get to um, the females here 
who are who scored between three and five on the um, ACES scale. And when we applied, I mentioned that we applied all four of those models, and in fact, the same steps occurred in all of the, all of the models, with the exception of the CR and T. And what happened with it is, as we expanded this tree, for this subgroup of individuals, the ones who had scored between three and five and were female, the next factor that entered in was perception of community support. And if the perception, especially low perception of community support. Now, it's not included in here because the numbers were so small that we felt that we probably couldn't draw any conclusions, but I think it's interesting to note that that was the next uh, factor that entered in predicting uh, being bullied. And I say that because when we look at the bullying others, again, our original uh, node here are, uh, indicates that the modal category of 59% is that people don't bully others. And if that was the only information we had, we would have to uh, predict that people don't bully others. But again, we would be wrong in this instance 40.48% of the time. So now, using the Chade model again as the first attempt, the variable that, that seemed to be the best, single best predictor of um, bullying others is a score on the community support scale. Now, when this next uh, level was generated, again, there were five nodes that were generated. But the modal category was zero for all three of the, the nodes that were generated, and they had values higher than the score of 29. But let's take a quick look at this, this instance. We see that if students scored less than or equal to 21 on the community support scale, 60% of them reported that they had bullied others. Now, what does this 21, what does the score of 21 mean? Well, it was the 25th percentile on that scale, which says it is the low end of the scale. So students are perceiving low community support. The other uh, category that seemed to, to uh, play a role were people who scored between 21 and 29. So still low, but above the 25th percentile. And notice at this point, zero is still the modal category, but as the tree was expanded, the next variable that entered was age. And the category of age that seemed to be predictive of bullying others were teens between 13 and 15, or ranging from 13 through 15. And in that instance, 55% of them indicated that they were, in fact, uh, they had, in fact, engaged in bullying analysis. Looking at the, the um, this classification matrix for this group, <coughs> let me just recall that we said, with no other information, if all we had was the original node, we would be wrong in our classification in 40% of the cases, or 40% of the time. Um, and if we look at the risk analysis uh, in terms of the misclassification <coughs> for this, we see that we've reduced our error from 40% to 35.5%. So almost a 6% increase in accuracy in categorizing individuals as likely to bully others. And once again, if we look at the, well, you can look at either the hits or misses. I looked at the hits. And um, those that were predicted uh, to not bully others and of the group who actually did not bully others, we were able to correctly classify 60% of them. And of the group that were predicted uh, to bully others, 
of, of those who actually did engage in bullying behavior. Uh, again, we were able to correctly classify about 50.25. So what this tells us then is that by, uh, by uh, taking a look at the predict predictors of either bullying or bullying others, we can come up with a set of characteristics that seem to be related to them. And um, I'll just mention that the other uh, three models came out with exactly the same pattern of results for these. So, in summary then, maybe, if I can get back to where I was. I think so. So, um, utilizing all, all of the models, the best predictor for being bullied was actually five on the uh, ACE scale. But if you scored between three and five and were also female, that increased the likelihood. And the CRT model, as I mentioned, did say that the low perception of community support may in fact be important, but we really can't draw that conclusion yet. Bullying others, the best predictor were um, scores lower than the 25th percentile on community support. And um, those that were slightly higher between 22 and 25 if they also were teenagers of between uh, 13 and 15, they were the most vulnerable group. Okay, so the question is, what does this all mean? And how can we use this information? And where are we gonna go from, from, from here? Well, um, let me tell you a little bit about what's being done currently uh, in, in this community and nationally to address the issue of bullying on a school level. As, I, as Ronnie mentioned before, most of the interventions are on a school level. Most of them involve zero tolerance. And most of them involve like education of students on the effects of, of bullying. Um, they may also involve peer mentorships and, and things of that nature. The sorry part of all of this, folks, is that these interventions as a whole, if you look at the meta-analysis studies that have been done, they aren't very effective. That's the problem. And th that's the issue. That's why they were asking us, what are we missing? Well, what are we going to do with this information? Answer. One of the things that we think they're missing is that community engagement variable. Now, in our study, the community engagement was mostly volunteer activity. Those questions involved how much volunteer work, uh, how involved were you with your church, how involved with, were you in doing um, volunteer activities with communities, um, with, with peers, and, and so forth. That is a key issue. From a resiliency perspective, it makes a huge amount of success. Sim? In regards to community engagement, are yeah. you implying that with community engagement, people are going to be less likely to bully? Yes. Or are you going to say that people are going to be more able to recover from being bullied? Well, our, our research shows that they are much more likely, less likely to bully. Okay. Whether or not it's also a moderating variable for being bullied, does it lessen the effects? I think theoretically it does. And clinically, it also makes sense to me that, that it does. But with this one study, we weren't able to, to determine that, primarily because the questions weren't stated exactly the way we would want them to be stated to answer that question. However, however, Hang on to that question because I'm going to be addressing future directions, and that's exactly where we're going. That's part of that's part of our um, programmatic approach to this whole problem. So one key variable that we were able to go back to the community with, and this, by the way, happened last May because the, these results were presented 
to the youth core council, which, as I told you, consisted of all those contingency groups, about 100 people. Um, our student did this presentation. I had her actually get up there and present the, these uh, results. As a result, Utica City Schools adopted the idea. Oh, that makes sense. They've integrated what we call, what I call, planned helpfulness from the resiliency model in their gang, gang deterrence program. And they're getting, they say, they're getting results. Now, our next set of research projects is to actually determine whether they are. Okay, so we are designing a whole series of studies to examine whether planned helpfulness does reduce bullying behavior, and if you have been bullied, whether it reduces some of those negative effects. So those are the series of studies that um, we're, we're going uh, forward with. Um, one of our practicum students is actually involved with that gang deterrence program right now. She's working on taking this planned helpfulness model and helping Utica City Schools um, integrate it better into their, after their underground cafe program. That's where, where, it, where it is. But here's a good example of the cooperation and what it can, in fact, generate. Uh, the interest it can, can generate. We're very proud of our students for being able to do this, and you should see them, how enthusiastic they are about this kind of stuff. This is how we've gotten them really interested in the research and the methodology, because before it was like, hmm, what does this have to do with anything? <laughs> well, guess what? <laughs> it has an awful lot to do with an awful lot. <laughs> And now they're actually seeing it, so we're, we're, we're really, really pleased. The second major um, conclusion is that they need to be screening kids, especially females, on these ACE scores. And that is something that they are trying to figure out how to do politically. And you, you, you have no idea of the logistics that go into this sort of stuff, especially in the school systems. However, we have been successful in getting pediatricians <laughs> to answer these questions. And now they're on our backs. How can we get involved in this research? You see how contagious mm -hmm. it, it, it is? This is what's so exciting. When you use the term planned helpfulness, is that another way to refer to the community engagement? Yes. Yeah. Planned, I, I should explain that. Thank you for, you know, I, I get into this stuff, and I forget, you know, Joanne, that the rest of the world isn't necessarily into this. Planned helpfulness in, involves volunteer activities. It's a way of engaging individuals with the community. Now, why theoretically can I take these results and explain them in terms of the existing theories? You bet your life I could, but you wouldn't want to be bored for the next four hours on how many theories this this relates to, but it does have a very good theoretical base, both in clinical psych, in social psych, and in, in, in the sociological theories, too. It's a really good um, example of interdisciplinary research, and it's also a good example of research that, that practical research that can, be, that can be used to help build theory and models as well. So where are we going um, in the future? We have been invited um, by Oneida County to get involved in the design of their next TAP survey. These TAP surveys occur every four years. So next year, we'll be doing, they'll be doing another TAP survey. Now, um, that's no small feat. <laughs> I've been trying for years to get my head. And, and, and this data. Uh, but now we have an open door. They want us to sit down and help them design the, the next study because quite frankly, one of the limitations of this study is that some the survey questions, not all of them were really good survey questions, and they didn't all address exactly what we needed it to, to address. Um, but now we're going to have an opportunity to sit down and design the survey questions. 
we won't be able to add a whole lot because 135 questions is an awful lot of questions to begin with. School, getting into school districts for research is a monumental task even uh, of itself. They all, all of the superintendents from all of the 13 area districts are committed to this, this TAP survey. Um, so it's a perfect way in. The pediatricians want uh, us to, to pull out more of the physical based issues. Um, and that's the kind of questions they want to add to these surveys because we really weren't able to um, see the impact on the physical health because there weren't enough questions. Uh, but I, we as a group, are very interested in that question. And as I said, the pediatricians are saying, do we have to do this? Well, why aren't these in here now? Well, I'm sorry, I didn't hear. <laughs> Yeah, but we've got a slew of them interested in, in doing these sorts of, of, of uh, things. Um, going beyond that, um, as I said, we're able to now work with Utica, Utica City Schools um, on expanding this whole planned helpfulness model as a deterrent. And I want to go um, one step further because we now have folks from SUNY IT that can help us out here at looking at some of the physiological correlates like cortisol levels and look examining those cortisol levels as they predict illness um, and obesity in, in particular because obesity is a big issue here. So we've got a whole program of studies that um, look like we're going to be able to do uh, and with this, these ACE studies through our STOP ACE committee, as well as this um, broader group of individuals, and things are just beginning to to pull, to pull together. Uh, so we are we are feeling pretty high <laughs> at, at, at this point because it's it's taken a long time to be able to get to this point, to be able to get access. To, 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 to this data. And now they just automatically look to us. It's, it's really kind of neat. I just have a question on the, on the tab. Yeah. How are the people selected? Are they asked if they want to participate? Oh, All yes. It's okay. a census. It's a so census. Okay. Yeah. So students can opt out, but very few do. Yeah. Okay. So right. it's a pretty representative sample of Oneida County. Now right. the question is how, how, um, how does our Oneida County sample compare nationally? Well, uh, overall, they compare about the same. Nationally, if you look at the national statistics, they're about the same in terms of what self-reports are. So we're probably pretty similar in, in, in that regard. And as I said, most of the interventions to date have not included this community engagement, and it seems to be pretty powerful. I was going to add just a couple of things in terms of long term. Um, we also we actually have four waves of the TAP data. We have 99, 2007, 2009, 2011. Yes, I forgot to say. Um, 2003, too, I forgot. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, three, seven, and 11. And so we're, the next thing we're going to do is look and see if these, um, we use just the most recent wave, but we want to go back and look and see if the other waves show the same patterns. Um, the other thing is that we got permission to use these data in our classes. So our community behavioral health students got to use this data set to learn how to manage SPSS, to look at survey question uh, construction, and to yeah. say, well, how come they did it this way? I said, well, because they didn't ask me first whether that was a good idea. <laughs> um, so it was, it was really great for them to have that practical tool, and they yeah. could say, well, I want to see if this correlates with this in this data set. So now that we're in, thanks to Joanne's um, hard work uh, with the Youth Council, uh, they've really been very generous with allowing us to use these data in multiple ways. So it's it really is a, a great a great yeah, bonus. It's, it's really and good. we're hoping to have um, be able to fine tune the ACE questions themselves so that we can get the full range or at least a broader range next time around. So I mean, some of these things seem to be quite difficult to measure. I'm thinking specifically of community engagement. What what sorts of metrics do you have to uh, to uh, keep track of? They, they are specific questions that ask how often do you get involved right. um, 
So th they're just simple mm -hmm. self-report. Yes, participatory. Right. Sports activities, yes. as yeah. Joanne was saying, church activities, straight up volunteering. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So it's a range of things. Yeah. about the TAP survey, and, and I've looked at it years ago, and, and I've kind of forgotten, um, how, how well do they define bullying behaviors? Because one of my beefs when I was in, in the school district was that, for instance, on the office discipline referral, yeah. it would say bullying. Yes. Well, bullying can take on a myriad of shapes and sizes. Right. And you know, it can be isolation, it can be physical. Yeah, I was just thinking that too. Yeah. It, it oh, is, she has, it is, Rosemary uh, gets the questions. I think. Have oh, you oh, ever oh. been teased, harassed? Yes. I mean, it gives you a list of things. Oh, yeah. Oh, and it then, also, in this last iteration, had a separate cyberbullying yeah. there, there question. Um, so you're right, defining it can yeah. be can be yeah. difficult. They're not um, only double barreled, they're triple and quadruple yeah, barreled. Right. Right. Yeah. So and for, and that's, uh, by the way, that's one of the things that they're working on in designing the new uh, the TAP survey right. to clarify what, what do we mean by bullying and, and make it clear. Yeah. Right now what we had was being bullied. Do you feel constantly bullied, meaning regularly th uh, teased, threatened, or harassed by other youth in a hurtful way? Has anyone ever personally threatened, harassed, or bullied you through instant email, instant message, email, chat room, comment, I mean, comment, cell phone, text message, or online post. This one is what, eight or ten barrel? Yeah. Yeah, yeah but, so. But, but it, it works for us because it's presence or absence. Yes. Right. right. Yes. Or presence or absence. So that's. That's not, not such a bad thing. But if you redesign it, you could look at intention, right? Right. right. You could really yeah, start that's exactly it. right. That's why we're happy that we were invited yeah. to the table mm -hmm. to, um, to, to do this for the next iteration, because we think we could help clean it up. And we don't have infinite control, because they, they use this TAP survey um, for a number of different purposes. So, you know, it's not like a, we could walk in there and say, well, could you ask this question, this question, this question? I wish right. that were true, but it isn't true. But we will be able to clean up, and we will be able to add, especially on the, the physical health dimension, because that is something that they're, they're all concerned about. But the pediatricians in particular, because the rates, according to the pediatricians, of um, complaints, you know, the number of kids that they're seeing with physical health problems, including the heightened blood pressure. I mean, pathological blood pressures are, are much higher than they have seen in the past from their, their perspective. And our rates of obesity and asthma have skyrocketed um, in, in this community. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's consider, a considerably difficult issue. I was going to say just a couple of quick political points too. One is that one of the reasons we can get access to these data is because there are no school identifiers. Yes. So it's only county level. That's the big yes. fear, right? Yes. One school is going to look sure. worse than another. Sure. Um, the other thing you should know is that Herkimer County also does this regularly, um, and it, we're hoping that if we look helpful we to are, we, Oneida we, County, that they're going to okay, they good. Just That's have good. Asked us to get involved with them. So that that will give us a, a broader yeah. set to work yeah, with. We them. just got our, our <clears> entry <throat> into their data big, but um, too. So as I said, I think this represents a fabulous opportunity. Um, it's really a good example, as I started out by saying, where service and scholarship are coming together to, to really produce some interesting series of, of studies. It adds to the literature um, the, on, on bullying and, and resiliency, um, but it also has is, I've said, a bit of impact. Um, if, if these things are really going to change the nature of, of our community, that's fabulous. Can we say that all the time? No. <laughs> Can we say that in this instance? Probably yes. They really are taking us seriously because they asked the questions. They were partners in, in generating the, the the concerns. It wasn't us just coming in and saying, well, I'm interested in, in this, let me use your, your population. It wasn't that at all. It was a very collaborative um, 
interaction. Here's a concern. How can how can we frame these questions? Um, what do we need to do? Can you give us any help or direction? And and just by guiding the process of saying we need evidence base to start to, to ask the right questions and to identify the right factors here uh, made absolutely good sense. So. You know, again, we're very privileged because we're a small community, and we can work together. And that, that, that's a message I'm going to push and push and push and push and push. Sorry, but I think it's, I see students here, so that's why I'm saying it. Yeah, cooperation is is a key issue uh, here. So the, the the power of predictive analytics is really crucial to be able to. Mm -hmm develop these dependencies. Right. To what extent do the predictive analytics provide you with feedback to know how to improve the survey or to add survey questions to clarify the future results? They, they don't really. No, it's, it's more a theoretical okay. question. But one of the things that they do is they tell us which of the predictors we should be careful about trying to clarify and identify and ask better questions about, I think. Joe, in, in your ACES project, you've been working on this, you've been chipping away in, in a lot of places. It seems as though there's the environment in which they occur, the ACE experiences. There's the environment that you're trying to affect now, which is the social and, and whatever environment around after they occur. And then there's the individuals right. coping with right. after they've already occurred. Are, do you have projects taking oh, place? And, oh, I'm, yes, I we do. <laughs> I knew you did. <laughs> <laughs> We're going to take a lap. <laughs> okay. Anybody who needs to leave? <laughs> no. <laughs> no you, you think she's joking. <laughs> yes, the answer to your question is this is just one of the projects that uh, have come out of the ACE initiative. Mm -hmm. We have another whole set of projects that are looking at pregnancy complications. Maybe next year we'll have data to present to you um, on that. That's really, I think. I think I saw that in the IRB. Committee. I think you might have. <laughs> you yeah. might have heard of that. Yeah, um, there's another whole set of ACE factors coming in with parenting, and we're working with MVLIR. And there's another whole group of, of studies that are looking at grandparenting as a also, uh, MVLIR. And also with, with MVLIR. So it, it, there are many tentacles here, and it may seem like it's all over the place, but it really isn't. It relates back to these basic ideas and models, and um, just looking to see how they, they go. <laughs> but they're all rooted in family dynamics, yes. essentially. Yes. Right? Yes. Well, thank you all so much for, for participating. Yes. Thanks for all the great questions. Thanks to our presenters for a fascinating talk. Great work. Thank you. Thank you.